Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, uh, Lisa Muscatine, and we're really uh, very delighted to uh, have with us uh, this evening the celebrated award-winning novelist, uh, Laura Lipman, uh, who's here uh, to talk about her new book, uh, Prom Mom. Uh, now, Laura, uh, of course, uh, has appeared at, at, at PNP uh, quite a few times for her earlier works, um, and many of you uh, may already be familiar with, uh, with her background, but for those who aren't, or those of you who might uh, need a little reminding, uh, let me just say that um, to start with, she wasn't always a novelist. Uh, she started out as a journalist, spending uh, uh, two decades as a, as a reporter, first in Texas, before joining The, the Sun in, in Baltimore, uh, where her dad had served as, a, as an editorial writer. Uh, Laura's first books, uh, set in, in Baltimore, were a, a series featuring reporter turned private investigator, uh, Tess Monahan. And after the initial um, seven uh, books in that series, uh, Laura left daily journalism to focus full time on, on book writing and hasn't really looked back. Um, that, was, uh, that was some 20 years ago. Uh, she went on to write uh, five more Tess Monahan books. Um, bringing the total to uh, 12, uh, but also branched out into standalone works, still, still centering on Baltimore and its uh, environs. A Prom Mom is her 13th standalone novel, and she's also written a number of novellas, short stories, and, es and essays, uh, and she's, she ta she's taught writing. Um, now, now, I'm not uh, going to, um, to get into um, the details of Prom Mom. I'm going to let Laura do that uh, in a minute, lest I give away something about the story that, that I shouldn't. Uh, but I will note that the book was written during the pandemic uh, and was very much influenced by those strange, dark times. Uh, much of the story is set uh, in that period, uh, in 2020, 2021. Um, and, the, um, and the book delights in the slow reveal of characters who aren't ex exactly uh, what they seem. A review in the Los Angeles Times called Prom Mom one of Laura's most seductively mesmerizing novels, with surprises at the end that might well compel many of you to reread the whole story again just to find out how Laura um, layered this tale with clues and misdirection. Another reviewer praised the book as an exquisitely crafted tale of triangulation and treachery. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Laura Lippman. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Thank you for having me back here at Politics and Prose. We can't figure out how many times I've been here. Neither, no one remembers the last time I was here. It's just all very vague at this point. But I know that I know that I started coming here before you owned it. I do know that, but so sometime in the early aughts, I think. So um, I don't usually do this. I'm gonna to begin tonight by talking about a little bit of inside baseball, which is when you write a novel, there are four pre-publication reviews that you can get. There are four magazines that do pre-publication reviews, Publishers Weekly, Kirkus Reviews, Booklist and Library Journal. And I just made it clear a really long time ago, I don't want to see the bad reviews. Why? I mean, so it's like, I know that my publicist knows not to send them to me. And I know which one is missing. You know, I'm sort of like, I know, but I'm like, I don't go looking for it. I'm really a big believer. And like, why would I do that? I don't need to know. I don't really, I mean, and you know, I'm sure that maybe someday someone's going to write a really constructive negative review, which would help me, hasn't happened, so. And the thing is, is you never really can avoid it anyway. Someone will somehow throw it in your path. And I thought I'd gotten pretty good at sort of building, you know, all my defenses up. But the other day on Twitter, I saw a snippet from what I assume was a negative review because I've never seen the whole review. It was from Kirkus. And what it said was, fascinating in its heartlessness. And I'm like, yes, it is. Yes, it is. It is that. And I thought that, I felt very complimented by that. I was like, why is that bad? I'm very pleased to be 
fascinating in my heartlessness. <sighs> Sorry. So Prom Mom is a book that begins in the fall of 2019. And everyone knows what happened in 2020 and 2021. And I think the question comes up is, does anyone actually want to read about those years? Obviously, I hope so. Why set a book during that time? What would be the point? Is it too soon to write about those years? So this is where I was when I started writing the book. First of all, the book was inspired by a podcast. It was inspired by You're Wrong About, if people know that, which at the time was hosted by Sarah Marshall and Michael Hobbs. It's now just Sarah Marshall. And You're Wrong About has grown out of Sarah's long held fascination with sort of restoring the reputation of women who have been wronged. And this began with a long project that she wrote on Tanya Harding. And she has since looked at a lot of other women in our culture who she feels got kind of a bum deal. Um, one of the ones that comes to mind is the woman who became the first woman at the Citadel. And you basically, the theory behind the show is if you take an in-depth look at anything, you're going to find out that the media at the time or what we think we remember about the story is probably somewhat exaggerated, somewhat unfair. And this has been Sarah's gig for a while. So she actually did a show called Prom Mom. And even the show involved more than one prom mom. Something that came to light as I researched this is um, we've had a lot of cases in which teenage girls have given birth untimely in a public place and the child didn't survive. Not always at dances, but this is something that has happened with some frequency and not to be political, it's my expectation it's going to begin happening with some frequency again. I don't see how that wouldn't be a byproduct of some of the legislation we're seeing in the country right now. So I wasn't really interested in a real case. I wasn't really paying attention. It was 2020. It was cold. It was toward the end of the year. And I was out walking because I don't know what everyone else did in 2020. I just walked a lot. I walked a lot. I listened to a lot of podcasts and I'd finished a book. Um, and now I had to start thinking about my next book. And I'm walking along and I can see exactly where I was. I was walking along the harbor in Baltimore and they were talking about one of these cases. And the thing that comes up is, you know, the girl often is like, I didn't know. And I think there'd always been a part of me that was a little bit skeptical of that. But then Sarah said something sarcastic like, oh, right, because teenage girls are so in touch with their bodies and know everything that's going on all the time. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's right. This is possible. So I, I am often inspired by real life cases, but I'm not writing about them. I'm really not. And I know that there's a tendency to talk about this was ripped from the headlines. It takes me 12 to 15 months to write a book. So that's like really a slow, slow, slow rip. I'm, I'm not interested in the actual case. I don't want to play that law and order game where I'm pretending to have insider knowledge of a real crime. I'm interested in some sort of theme that this has kicked out. And so I think what I was interested in is like, well, who do you get to be after you've been prom mom? And what about the boy who was her date? Who are you 20 years later? And I did find one fact about another case in which the boy and the girl, now a man and a woman, many, many years later became friends on Facebook. And that really caught my attention. I'm like, okay, now I think I know what I want to write about. So I wanted to write this story of someone who'd left her hometown more than 20 years ago, basically disgraced, jailed in a juvenile facility, and finally comes home again, has no intention of staying. But the minute she's back in Baltimore, she has to start looking for that guy. And first it's on social media, and then there's a chance encounter. And the idea was to sort of show what I'll call the slow burn toward transgression. Um, I was really honored in the LA Times Review to be compared to James Cain because Cain is one of my heroes. For those of you who don't know, Cain was from Maryland and he would end up dying here in the suburbs. I believe he was in Hyattsville when he died. 
He'd grown up in Maryland. His father was the president of Washington College. Uh, Kane worked on the Baltimore Sun, and he also worked for H.L. Mencken's American Mercury and had hoped when he lived as a young man in Maryland to be an opera singer. He never got to be that instant. He wrote a book called Serenade, which is about opera singers. And also Mildred Pierce, of course, has a young woman who's trying to become an opera singer. So I love Kane. I mean, what's not to love? And yet I'm always amazed by Kane's world in which people so quickly decide to do something criminal. And if you have ever read or seen Double Indemnity, like chapter two, it's like, let's kill my husband. And I'm like, these are two people who have literally just met a door-to-door -door insurance salesman and this unhappy you know, wife, and they're plotting the murder of her husband in chapter two. And I love it. And, you know, and the film is even better. It's written by Raymond Chandler and directed by Billy Wilder. But I'm really interested in that slow march toward doing something horrible. Like, how do you get there? I'm not particularly interested in capital V villains, capital E evil. I'm much more interested in how people who identify as good end up doing something horrible. And so that was really what I was after in writing Prom Mom. So now you have this question. It's 20, it's now early 2021. I'm going to start writing the book. Does it have to be set during a pandemic? I didn't know how not to set it during the pandemic. I mean, I don't think that's the most commercial choice a writer can make. And I think it asks a lot of people to go back to those years. I don't know for y'all, to me, 2020 and basically the, er the first six months of 2021 feel like they were about 10 years ago. I just like, like that happened. So I almost feel like I'm writing about a historical era. And it was key to the story because what I really wanted to write about was a time and place where the normal rules felt suspended, where nothing felt like what it usually was. And in that kind of slow, almost congealed in amber world, I felt like it was more likely that people would do things that went wildly against their nature. And that was what I was really interested in exploring. This book is almost impossible to talk about without spoilers. Like after the first three chapters, things are already being revealed. So part of what I like to do tonight, I hope people have questions and we can talk more about just my work in general, because at this point, really, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start spoiling prom mom for you. And I really don't want to do that. Um, I, I will say, just as a side note, um, the character, Amber, who is the prom mom, I, again, I began writing this book in early 2021. I turned it in on March 31st, 2022. And you know, went through editing for th through the spring and into the summer. All of the character in the novel comes home and opens a gallery that features what we would call outsider art or visionary art. Through so just the craziest coincidence in the world, when my book was done, the American Visionary Art Museum in Baltimore put out a call for people to become docents, and I was accepted. And I've trained as a docent. And I'm now a docent at the American Visionary Art Museum. <laughs> Which, um, which is what, and I wish I had all of that training before I wrote this book, but so it goes. Um, so let me just like kick it open. Oh. Hi. <laughs> um, let me kick it open to questions and I'll repeat the questions since I'm being videotaped. Or you can walk up to the microphone. I don't care which way you do it. You can just raise your hand and shout at me or, oh yeah, Angie's gonna be the. So first of all, I did read that carcass, and I thought it was delightful. I didn't think of it as a negative review at all. <laughs> I thought it was great. I was like, wow. I mean, I had already read it, but I was like, if I hadn't read it, I would have wanted to read it even more. Um, I guess one of the questions that um, I wanted to ask was, and this is 
it's hard because it is, I mean, it's definitely not a spoiler because I'm not going to say anything about the substance of it. But I do have to say that I think even more than your other books, this one I got to the end and I was like, what just happened? And but in a good way, right? In, a, in <laughs> such a good way, in like such a masterful way, because I think it's really hard for us to be surprised um, as readers nowadays, because I feel like we've seen so many twists and so many versions of twists. And the way I, I don't know how I'm trying to figure out, like I'm actually rereading it from the beginning. And I think that's like the mark of an amazing book with a great twist is when you immediately, when you close it and you immediately want to go back and just sort of reread it with this new, you know, gaze. And I guess I wanted to ask you just from a craft perspective, did you always know what the ending was going to be and or like just talk a little bit about your process and whether you're more organic or you know, whether you plotted it out, just because I just feel like it was just seriously just made it unbelievable for me. And I was just like, wow, this is just amazingly done. I loved it. I sort of knew the big secret. I knew the big secret, which is that final reveal. And I generally do know the big secret, but there's a lot that changes as I go through draft after draft after draft. I We, ha we do live in kind of a twist crazy culture right now. And I think that there's some readers who are more interested in whether they figure out the twist in, than in whether they're actually enjoying the book. Right. Like there's just like this endless calculation. And I don't really worry about whether I fool people. Like I, I've always said you, what you should worry about is will the person who figures this out on page 50 keep going? And so that's my hope that they'll be like, okay, I've got kind of on top of this, but what are these three people going to do because you have the girl who was you know convicted or you know pled to the death of this child you have the boy that she's still obsessed with now a man and you have his wife who by you know who seems to be a very good wife who knows everything about her husband and has forgiven him and has told him over and over again that it's never too late to be good so I'm not trying to be a trickster. And I think, I hope, I shouldn't say I think, I hope that because I'm not focused, overly focused on the mechanics of plot, I like to think that they're driven by character, that there's something organic about it. I am really aware. I think the best writers are aware that they're doing a lot of misdirection. They're really good at getting you to look at this when you should be looking at that sometimes in the same scene. I mean, you've read the book, and I can talk about this one scene, I think, without giving anything away. There's a moment where two characters are having a conversation about another character, and they go, oh yeah, that thing really messed up her family. And one character is talking about one thing, and the other character is talking about something else. And that's like the way people talk. They just kind of talk past each other, and they think everyone has the same context. So I'm really aware of that. And also, you know, I was just like, I mean, Angie, I can't imagine how many drafts you do of your novels, because, you know, like, like a lot. <laughs> I mean, you go through, and it's draft after draft after draft, and you see the possibilities, and you begin to see where just like the tiniest word change you know, I, I'm in I'm in the final drafting stage of my next book, and <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Thanks for that question, but sir, I, w I was telling a couple of members of the staff here that I thought the most overpowering police presence ever in this area was when the Lyon sisters disappeared. Oh, right. In the seventies, right. uh, is there any explanation? What was the final outcome there? I know they were digging in this farm in Virginia and uh, so beyond that, I'm not sure what. You know, that was something that was, I, I don't even have the right adjective to describe. For those who don't know, I wrote a book called What the Dead Know that was clearly inspired by the disappearance of the Lion Sisters. But again, it was just like that one fact two sisters disappeared, how would that happen? And I wrote an entire novel that has nothing to do with what really happened. But then years after my book came out, my book came out in 2007, 
um, there were some developments in the case and it was it was very disturbing and I I don't know I, I mean I'm not a true crime person I'm not I'm not investigating I just know it was in the newspaper I have no additional information but it does appear that they identified someone that they were relatively sure was responsible it's ironic. I wanted to talk about that same book. I went to hear you uh, speak about that book at the Borders and Seven Corners when you wrote that oh, book. Oh, gosh, yeah. Okay. And to give an idea of, I think, the power of what you both say and what you write, one of the things that I remember you talking about was that people have a tendency to blame the victims, and we need to get away from blaming the victims. Now, that was, you know, when you wrote that book, that has stayed with me. And I keep trying when I hear things on the news, don't blame the victim, don't blame the victim. I, it, it's, it made that much of an impact on me, both the book and what you said. And I just wanted you to know that. Thank you. I mean, I do think that crime fiction actually can, can help people create empathy. And I, part of I what agree. I do is the reason I don't write about big villains and capitally evil is because those books actually help us stay at a really safe remove. Look, I love Hannibal mm. Lecter. I love... <laughs> Hannibal Lecter in almost every form and you know but if I'm reading a novel by Thomas Harris I don't feel challenged in the sense of this could happen to me this could happen to someone I know this could happen to my neighbor yeah. and I feel that fiction does have that power to remind us that you know the victims yeah. are blameless yeah and and also but also that the victims should be human there, there's a lot of crime fiction where the victims almost feel like paper dolls yeah. They're just there to die so that, you know, someone can solve the murder and be the yeah. hero and bring the killer no, to your justice. books are always interesting. Well, thank you. I, I really, you know, I think everybody here agrees with that. I appreciate everyone coming out tonight. Hi. I just want to say I do appreciate that you're writing or you wrote something that is influenced by the pandemic because I kind of understand now why there's not a whole lot of art from the you know, the influenza pandemic, the last century. But I think in a way, maybe it will be appreciated even more in the future. <laughs> I mean, there's some, it's a pretty good document of what it was like. To, what was funny, I will talk about this, about writing about the pandemic. So I wrote about the pandemic that I knew, which is the Baltimore right. pandemic, probably pretty similar to the DC pandemic in terms of, um, and my editor lives in New York and she would ask me questions like, why aren't we? Here, why aren't the characters hearing sirens all the time? And I was like, well, because that didn't happen here. And she's like, you have a character who's a doctor. Why isn't she being asked to volunteer in the ER? And I'm like, well, okay, first of all, the character who's a doctor is immunocompromised. I said, that also didn't happen here. It happens that um, one of my best friends who lives a block from me is a doctor who specializes in infectious diseases. And her husband was in the ER at Hopkins. So I had a very good window on what the life of a doctor was like. But to just be reminded that it was like a different pandemic from state to state, from city to city, you know, in Maryland, from county to county. It was so, you know, from school to school. It was just very different. So I, I will tell you one thing about that I've thought about so much is that there were things that we did, I did, during the pandemic that actually were like, oh, wow, this is a good practice. This is something I should keep doing when the pandemic is over. And I'm, I'm speaking specifically about grocery shopping, how I grocery <laughs> shopped during the pandemic. I was so disciplined. I did menu planning. I had this, I had like, you know, actual like stationery that was for menu planning. And I would have my grocery list on there. And I went to this small, very good grocery store that I could be in and out of in 20 minutes. It also happened to be the only grocery store in Baltimore that sells liquor. And, um, <laughs> and it was just like, and it was amazing. My household ate so well. I spent less money than I've ever spent on food. It was so organized. We had the best leftovers. Why am I not still doing that? And I just, I'm so confounded by, there were some behaviors that we adopted that were actually pretty good. I don't, I mean, frankly, I think I should still be wearing a mask when I travel. Um, but that's one of the thing that, things that interests me. I haven't read a lot of pandemic books. I think one of the best is Lucy by the Sea by Elizabeth Strout. Mm -hmm. But I also think the best 
pandemic books, in my experience, are the ones that background the pandemic. It's like there, it's happening, but it's not what the book is about. It's just something that's happening while the other things are happening. Right. So, right. But thank well, you. Well, I am keeping my sourdough going. Oh, <laughs> I love it. I love that you kept your sourdough going. That's fantastic. In what ways does your writing style pick up on uh, Stephen King's writing style, for example, he incorporates uh, fantasy sometimes in his stories. And are your stories uh, accurate? And, and uh... I don't think I'm I'm thinking very hard because there are not as many books as Stephen King has, but there is a good number. I do not believe that I have ever availed myself of any kind of fantasy or ghost or anything. I don't think there's anything that's ever happened in one of my books that couldn't actually happen in real life. I mean, I love Stephen King. I mean, I, I love him as a writer. I actually like him as a person. I've met him a couple of times. And I reviewed the second book. There's Mr. Mercedes and What Came Next. What came after Mr. Mercedes? Does anyone remember? It was the one about the book? Yeah. yeah. And I loved it, but I was almost a teeny bit disappointed when, when it it began to go into fantasy at the end. Because I was like, look at Stephen King. Stephen King can, of course, write a kick-ass PI novel. I loved those characters. So, But no, I don't think I've ever availed myself of an otherworldly suggestion for the things that are happening. Mm -hmm. so. And uh, how much of the experience of prom night um, played into this book uh, from your own experience or maybe your kids? Well, my kid is still quite young. I'm an old lady with a young kid, so I haven't actually sent my kid to a prom yet. Um, so I, I, this kind of brings me on to kind of back into this question. When I first started writing this book, I began approaching it almost as if I were making a true crime documentary. And there were, I, I went back, I, I threw away more than 100 pages in writing this book because I had written all of these chapters that were sort of like talking heads of people who knew the main characters and who were somehow proximate to the crime. And it would be like, this is what the guidance counselor had to say. And this was the maid at the hotel who discovered the crime scene. And this was someone who worked at the ice cream shop with Amber. And I just wrote and wrote and wrote. And I threw out all of it because I didn't want to write a true crime documentary. I didn't want to write in that style, which is so omnipresent in the culture, especially in podcast. I wanted to be really interior because again, I think that kind of tracked with the pandemic. We were all really deep inside our own heads and our own thoughts. So I didn't want that sense of this is a whodunit. This is, you know, another true crime story. I wanted to have only the people who were involved, Amber, Joe, and now Joe's wife. However, there are a number of these one-off chapters from prom that focus on sort of the rituals of prom, buying the dress, the corsage, the, the theme. Um, I'm, I'm missing one. And then finally, the limo. And, you know, my editor was like, why are these chapters in the book? I'm like, I don't know. They just have to be. <laughs> so I, I wanted that. That's what I wanted us to have from the past. It's the sense of this was a very normal night until it wasn't. So, um, but, you know, I went to my prom. I went with a friend. It was perfectly fine. Um, I'm hearing from a lot of people now. I'm now kind of like, people confess to me whether or not they went to their prom. If they didn't go, they wish they had. If they did, they don't think it was a big deal. <laughs> so it's interesting that this has such a, it's so enshrined in our culture as being a big deal because I don't think it actually is. Hi. Hi. Um, I had a question about something you said at the very beginning where you were wondering if it was too soon to write about the pandemic. And I'm wondering if while you were editing, your kind of perception or the way you were telling the story of the pandemic changed as the pandemic got farther into hindsight. And if you think that that might, like as we get farther away from the pandemic, the stories that are going to come out about the pandemic will change the through line. Or... Yeah, I mean, I think it really was key that I was writing about 2020 and early 2021. I mean, the book actually ends in spring of 2021, which you remember, we were all so hopeful. 
<laughs> like we're all like, yay, it's going to be over. And, you know, by fall we were back in. So it, I think that helped because it felt like I was writing about an absolute discrete phase of it. I did enjoy drawing on some of my own memories. I kept really good journals. Again, that I'm not as good. I was, I've always kept journals, but during the pandemic, I was an exceptional journal keeper. And those journals helped me write my books. And now I'm like being really bad at keeping my journals again. I'm like, why can't I stick with my good habits? And, you know, one of the things I drew on was my memory of what it was like to get that first shot. Because when I went and got my first vaccination, I almost burst into tears. And I realized that I'd been like almost rigid for however many months not allowing myself to think about how mortal I was. And when that needle slid into my arm at giant pharmacy, I was like, oh my God, I'm not gonna die. And just admitting to myself for the first time how long I'd been worried about death and illness. And it was so, I, yeah, but I think probably we'll see more and I'll say, you know, books that actually have more to say about the pandemic. In my book, it's very much in the background. There's no foreshadowing. You never have a character who's like, I heard some story on the radio about this virus in China. No, everyone's just going about their lives and kind of barely paying attention, but it shapes the choices they begin to make day to day. I mean, there, there are two characters in this book having an affair. I mean, I, early on in the pandemic, I heard a report on NPR about people who are managing to have affairs during the pandemic, and I was like, people oh my god <laughs> people are just so amazing <laughs> hi um first before my questions want to put a plug in for your uh twitter page or it's you know twitter is like <laughs> normally a hellscape but she posts pictures not every morning but frequently almost every of morning. baltimore harbor with the domino sugar in the background and good morning baltimore and then usually a funny or interesting so i enjoy that i, I actually Thank look forward you. to that every day um my question is actually about Dream Girl, and I really like that book. And um, without getting too much into the plot of that, you know, it's it's a writer who basically steals someone else's book, and the plot was kind of like that as well. And normally, you would think writing about writing wouldn't necessarily be so popular. Why do you think that they both were able to work? Uh, well, thank you for saying it works. I will say no. In the plot, he steals a plot. Right. In my book, my character is like, I did not steal anything. I made that up in my head. And I, I actually believe him, but he's also a terrible person yeah. who deserves all the things that happened to him. <laughs> uh, Which are terrible. He is, he's, um, well, first of all, you know, I, I think inevitably a lot of writers want to do a writer book because it is what you know. And it's like, there are these funny in jokes that you can make for your friends. I will say, I'm trying to remember some of the in jokes in Dream Girl, um, but, it, Dream Girl for me now feels like if if the early part of the pandemic feels like it was 10 years ago, writing Dream Girl feels like it was 40 years ago. It's hard for me to keep stuff in my head. I will say that in um, in um, Prom Mom, there was a scene that I was actually pressured to take out of the book. And it's a rather satiric view of a book club. And it's seen through the <laughs> eyes of one character and she's like, that one's going to drink too much. That one won't have read the book. That one will have watched the movie. That one's going to be like, well, why can Toni Morrison say this and I can't say that? Yeah. And um, exactly. my editor was like, oh, do we really need this scene? And I'm like, oh, yeah, we need this scene. And I, um, I teach at Eckerd College every January. And it's a program that's at the university, at the college, but not under the, you know, it's with the college, but it's with for students outside of the college. And um, I read that as my reading this year. And I mean, the authors all had a good time. <laughs> it was like, so yeah, I just, you have to try it at least once, I think. Yeah. Yeah. One other quick thing. I, I really like that you had a kind of a cameo from Tess Monahan. And it wasn't the whole book about her, but it just was sort of like an aside. And that was fun for me. So yeah, that's my series character. I'm still yeah. trying to figure out yeah. how other writers, she, um, my next book, the book that I think will be out next year, is all about one of the really um, secondary characters in Tess Monaghan got a book to herself. Okay. So And so Tess shows up again because, you know. Got to do it. Briefly. <laughs> you just, I'd like someone to like wave from the back. Are there any more questions or? Can you tell us anything about the adaptation? Of, I, you know, of, of Prom Mom? 
No, because the deal was made. Actually, I mean, I really was talking to him like back in January or February. The deal was made. It was signed well before the writer's strike. But now nothing's happening. I mean, like, you know, no one no one can be attached as a writer. No one can be attached to act in it. That's just how it is. And I 100 percent support the, the writer's strike. It's a little bit complicated. I've never written for film or television, so I am not a member of the Writers Guild of America. But I have been very conscientious about supporting the strike. Um, people I know quite well were on the negotiating committee. Something even came up where it was like, can I sign this contract right now? Am I, you know, do I have the right? Do I have the right not to sign it? And then it turned out that the contract's going to take forever anyway. So the strike will probably be over before I sign it. But yeah, no, I can't even tell you that much about Lady in the Lake. I still don't. Yeah, that's it's done. I mean, or it's in post. So that's not affected by the writer's strike because that has been completely shot, should be almost completely edited at this point, and they just have to pick a run date. And now, again, because of the writer's strike, the various studios are trying to make this calculation of do we bring things out sooner or do we hold on to things because we might be facing a dearth of stuff to see very soon. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, I know you mentioned using Tess Monahan as a secondary character. Will she ever be a main character again in a novel? I want her to be. I, I you know, for those who, I mean, I wrote a series character. I love her very much. And then I did something that I thought was so clever and so unusual is I made my female PI a mom. And there's a reason there are not a lot of moms in PI fiction. <laughs> there are a lot of challenges to writing that. And so what I've resolved for myself when it comes to Tess Monahan is that when I have the right story for her, I will bring her back. But also when I bring her back, I will know what the ending of her story is. And that could mean I could bring her back for one book and be like, this is the final Tess Monahan book. It could be a trilogy of books. I just don't know. Um, I obviously miss her. I wrote her into Dream Girl. I've written her into the book that I'm currently writing. She's appeared in some short stories. One of my pandemic projects when things are like really still is a children's magazine reached out to me to write something. And so my daughter and I collaborated on a story about Tess Monahan's daughter and how she cracks her first case. Because, you know, the idea of being like, you know, the apple never falls that far from the tree. So, yeah. And I have also, again, before the writer's strike happened, I sat down and had a very long conversation with my film agents. And I said, you know me, I don't want to write for film or television with one exception. I want to write the Tess Monahan pilot, and then I want to hand it off to someone. And so we had started having this conversation about how they would kind of like match make me to a showrunner. Hmm. And so, but I'm adamant that the t there will be no Tess Monahan TV or film adaptation without me. That's the only thing I'm sticking to my guns on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for liking her. Anyone else, or should I start signing books? <laughs> A very shy crowd tonight. Oh, Angie's going to go. I, 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 have I, mean, I can just ask you questions all day long. Um, what about I? The other thing that I loved was the sort of juxtaposition of the characters' thoughts about New Orleans and Baltimore, and sort of how those, you know, there and and some of the differences and some of the characters thinking about that. And so I thought that was really cool um, because I know that that you have a deep love of both. Yeah. Well, you know, New Orleans is my other hometown. I can, I, I still own a place down there. I don't get there as much as I want to, but it's like in my heart I do. And I, New Orleans is a terrifying city to write about. It New Orleans has a literary community. It has a group of local writers. They just lie and wait and wait for you to say something really <laughs> stupid about New Orleans. <laughs> like they just, you know, so I know that, but I was like, but if I write about it, through the eyes of a character who, like me, is basically a transplant who's fallen in love with it, I felt like I could maybe get away with it. I haven't heard from anyone in New Orleans yet, you know, fingers crossed <laughs> that, you know, I, I, can, I can just imagine what someone's going to give me grief about. Like, oh, they never served that dish at Upper Line. Or, um, but yeah, I love New Orleans, and I do think that there are things about New Orleans that remind me of Baltimore, and yet it's yeah. a very different city, and I... Yeah, I, I never thought I would love another city as much as I love Baltimore, but I do love New Orleans as much. Nina. Hi. Hi, Laura. Hi. Um, 
Maybe this is uh, out of bounds, but I wanted to bring up the lovely essay that you published um, earlier. That was this year, right? Yeah, that okay. was this year. Uh, called The Summer of Fall. And if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And I wanted to ask, and I, I know this is something we've talked about before, but finding your voice as a... a as an essayist versus um, a fiction writer. What was that like for you? Uh, was it difficult? I don't know. Open question Thank to you. fill some time. <laughs> I mean, it took a while. I mean, actually, Nina, the way we know each other is because we entered a, a writer's group together when I was just beginning to try to write personal essays. And at first, the quest to write personal essays was incredibly just crassly commercial mm -hmm. because part of the way you promote yourself as a novelist is to write pieces and place them in magazines. And I was trying to learn how to do that. And I think, I mean, at once it was kind of exhilarating and terrifying. As a novelist, everyone assumes everything's true anyway. So everyone thinks I'm Tess Monaghan. <laughs> And they they think I they think I used to be married to a cop who abused me and then I killed him and they're like you know it's just like everyone thinks it's a, but at the same time you're like I know it's not true I don't worry about what people think is true, but to start writing about your own life, yeah you really have to be like okay I'm gonna have to grow a thick skin because people are gonna be judging me, mm. and something that made me really happy today I I. I saw a friend who had just read this essay. This essay is only available online through a pay service called Script. So you can't read it unless you sign up for like the free trial. And a friend had gotten around to doing it. And the thing she said that made me so happy was she's like, I laughed so much reading it. And it made me happy because I think it's a funny essay. Yes. It's an essay about a lot of terrible stuff that happened to me last summer. <laughs> I fell down, my mom fell down, my sister's in a nursing home with Parkinson's. It was just sort of like this rolling series of catastrophes and I was so shocked. I don't remember how this came up. I, th I think it was because I did an interview with The Guardian and they said, how soon did you pitch the article after your mom fell? And I went to my <laughs> email, 24 hours. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I'm a monster. But then I re read Claire Detter's Monster and I realized, no, a monster, you've got to be in a monster if you want to do this. Yeah. So yeah, it's, and I think it's still evolving. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, I know you've done some writing that kind of ventures into that. I feel like it's like you have to then like take a long respite. Yeah. Like the people who can do it constantly, whose life just churns enough content to keep writing, like, I don't think I want to live that kind of life. And I, know, I definitely don't want to do it in public. But yeah, thanks. I'm going to sign some books. Thank you for coming out on a beautiful night.